So uh, my name is David Henderson, and I'm uh, organizing the Comparative Psychoanalysis Research Group. So today we're going to be thinking about the first chapter of uh, the discovery of the unconscious by Ellen Berger, um, which is one of the um, classic books in psychotherapy. Um, and uh, there's so much in that chapter. <laughs> I don't really think that there's much point in itemizing things uh, one by one. Um, I'm sure that, you know, in our discussion, you'll be referring to lots of different um, elements of it. So I was trying to think um, what, are there any kind of overall themes or general kinds of uh, aspects of the chapter that strike me? I suppose one thing that strikes me thinking of our general discussion in these seminars about psyche and so on, is that one of the main elements here is what is impinging upon us from the outside or what's putting pressure on us from the outside or what's, you know, what is, and all the different ways we have of describing that and attributing the agency to different, uh, uh, creatures or forces or something, and how this problem of um, being impacted by something that is mysterious and uh, by turns kind of benevolent or dangerous is a kind of feature of human nature, of human society, and that we're, we're constantly working at uh, refining and trying to manage that, that sort of um, problem. Another thing that struck me looking, reading the chapter was how do, I mean, he's, how do we look at this? I mean, do we look at this like from the, which end of the telescope? You know, you could say, well, um, psychotherapy today has progressed far beyond these things he's describing. And, um, and uh, so we're looking into the distant past at traces of things. Or you could turn the telescope around and you could say, well, really what people are up to today is essentially what they've been up to all along. <laughs> and we talk about it in a different way or we organize it in a, in a particular sort of way. But the question is there has, um, is there progress? Does the idea of progress in relation to psyche um, make any sense? Or is the psychic situation of human beings pretty much a static thing, a given thing? And uh, we're, we're struggling with similar kinds of problems throughout history. It's not, and we're not really making great um, advances. Um, then finally, the thing that struck me also this reading at this time was there's, um, there's a paper by Homans on uh, Freud, Jung, and Carl Rogers, and uh, where he describes how they all had very difficult relationships with their fathers, and uh, and they they sort of removed themselves from the family religious context, and um, and then they uh, each went into some kind of what he what he was referring to as some kind of creative disorientation or illness, and then constructed their own psychologies. But the thing he was pointing out about all these psychologies is that they all privilege the child. And uh, in reading this chapter, there's, I don't think there's any mention of children. Um, and uh, so the, the kind of enormous uh, attention and weight we give <laughs> to the experience of the child and the 
needs of the child and all of that is something that seems to be completely missing from these uh, societies or these uh, forms of healing. I found that really striking. Um, I, I guess, I mean, there is an, a discussion to be had, I think about, you know, do we put too much weight on the child? Does, is the child made to carry too much um, meaning and importance in our own understanding of, of the psyche? You know, are there, or are there many other elements to it or ways of thinking about it which um, sort of get left out? Um, so anyway, those are the three general uh, <laughs> themes that, that I was left with uh, after reading it. Um, but as I was saying, there, there's so many particular little things where you could say, oh, you know, that's just like this, or that's just like this, or we do that, we still do that, or whatever. Um, but, um, I don't know what your uh, thoughts are from, reading, from the chapter or general uh, Impressions. There are not many of us, so I don't think we need to raise hands or anything like that. Well, I, I was struck by <coughs> A number of things. Um, one is the chapter I, I thought really nicely went over the, the history of, of how civilization has attempted to deal with um, various types of distress and problems in living. And um, that the indigenous, the indigenous approach um, seems seems to look at, like you said, David, an external agency or a force that has affected uh, the soul and, and then how to get either get rid of it or to ameliorate the, the internal conflict or internalized conflict, I should, say, I should say, if it came from the outside originally or as a demon or something like that. Um, but just how it puts into perspective, we are, we are just, you know, the, the last on the scene as so-called healers. Um, and, and how, you know, for centuries, uh, I mean, thousands of millennium, people have been attempting to, to deal with suffering in different ways. Um, and so, I guess it doesn't surprise me to see how um, psychotherapy would have been you know, really part of, you know, indigenous life in general. There's, they're getting the techniques of either a healing or um, enlightenment of some form of, of access to uh, fulfilling desires, uh, resolving conflicts. The other thing, um, that struck me is that there wasn't any talk really, unless I missed it, about our emotional lives. There was um, quite a bit ar around, you know, general physical malaise and feeling better. Um, there was the notion of the lost soul or the spiritual dimension that people were needing to heal, but there wasn't really a discussion around um, let's say conflicted uh, internal desires, unconscious conflicts or something like that, what we would say now, there wasn't really much about how did people deal with feelings. And so that, that kind of stood out for me. I guess there were feelings sort of referred to in the idea of the, these 
secrets, conflicts about secrets, though that those things he was talking about were more recent. Um, but there I wondered also about, I mean, the emotional aspect of feeling part of the community. So there, there was a sense of being alienated from the community. And then a lot of these um, things that were sort of how to reintegrate somebody into a community. So I suppose that has a kind of emotional <laughs> uh, resonance to it. I guess I would like to add something here. Um, if we're looking at the indigenous people and what are they doing, um, I would go back to your, your first statement, uh, uh, David, that there's nothing different happening uh, psychologically or <clears throat> in practice for healing. Um, what I think um, is perhaps over-exaggerated in our looking at the indigenous healing practices is that they um, don't have a distinction about inner and outer, uh, which I don't think is the case at all. I think there is a very clear a distinction about inner and outer in the indigenous healing practices that I've observed. And what I think was, is missing then in, in our uh, discussion about, well, what are those healing practices about? Um, uh, in a small community, probably the most important thing to get done is that there isn't a, an ongoing blame occurring. And that's what I think the uh, indigenous healing practices manage uh, to do, that there isn't a blaming. So therefore, uh, the, the agent for the, the problem is made quite abstract, while, uh, while I don't think that there is any lack of emotion uh, in, the whole, in the whole procedure. I don't know if I've made myself very clear, but that's uh, So does this like lack of blame, I mean, that's something that comes across like in discussions, mm -hmm. like in South Africa or about yeah. various African political situation right. where looking at it from outside, there's a feeling, well, justice is not being done, but then looking at it from their, their standpoint, right. uh, justice is being done because the community Yes. Harmony is being reestablished, yes. and yeah. that's the important thing, not right. um, punishment or something. Right. Yeah. Can I pick up on just one thing that, that Barbara was saying, that you were saying, Barbara? The, um, this, uh, the distinction between the inner and the outer, I find it very interesting that you, you know, uh -huh. that, that, uh, that in your observations, mm -hmm. that, that you've, you've you think the that distinction does exist quite clearly. Yes. But I I was also thinking when I was um, looking at this and and also hearing some of the other comments about um, uh, well, whilst it's true that it is there is that distinction. Do you think it's true to say, or I wonder whether it's true to say that it's it's somewhat different? And I'm I'm thinking of the the kind of greater porousness between the inner and the outer that. Um, you know, that says that, for example, um, Charles Taylor in his, in his sort of theorizing of the differences between pre-modern and modern consciousness yes. suggests um, were, yeah. um, you know, it, it, it exist and that that's in, in sort of pre-modern times, whilst there were distinctions in a sense between inner and outer, that's kind of part of mm -hmm. human experiencing in a sense, there was much more porous and there wasn't the sense of a very strongly bounded or as, as Taylor puts it buffered sense of of um, of, uh, of, of self separate from the, mm -hmm. the the outer so there was a much sort of um, a more more flowing back and forth as it were uh, mm -hmm. between inner and outer and that seems to to be perhaps suggested by some of these 
these practices i don't know to, to in, in in my sort of hearing of them mm. i don't know if that if that tallies or not with with your experience with the the sami and, and others yeah well what's so what has been so striking for me uh, uh working pa with patients in you know here we are a uh, modern world and you know getting all the information there from the sami about what they think about and what they see and what they're working with and um what what i start talking about uh, with the sami as well as um with my patients are fairy tales and these fairy tales they work very well uh one fairy tale it keeps coming up now uh and i can only just you know go on what what's happening in my practice uh, is the is the um, is the fairy tale of the Beauty and the Beast, and this idea that the beast is going to die if the beauty doesn't pay attention to it long enough. So this is a this is an idea of what do you pay attention to, and is it long enough? Yeah. So I, you know, and what is also, you know, um, I th uh, going back to what David said, I think in the beginning is, is there any real difference in how we are uh, suffering or how we are healing? And I, you know, I'm coming down with, no, I don't think so. Um, So the uh, description even of uh, possession or being uh, bewitched or a curse, uh, they're the same. They're the same now and they're the same, you know, back, uh, I think, in history. So. Just thinking of what you uh, said, Roderick, there's a, um, a paper about... Um, uh, how they choose shamans in uh, Canada. So I can't remember which bit of Canada it is, but they they talk about the the thin and the thick. Yeah. So they observe children, and the children who are thin are chosen to be trained as shamans, and the children who are thick, in other words, thick skinned, <laughs> are not. Right. So um, maybe there is a kind of more variability in uh, thin-skinned and thick-skinned characters than uh, comes across when we're so focused on healers and shamans because they're all sort of thin-skinned. Mm. Right. I thought it was uh, striking uh, in the description of uh, what made a good healing I think there were a couple of factors mentioned and one of them was that the healer or the shaman uh, is, is very convinced uh, of his method, which uh, is one of the factors which had been identified uh, by, by various researchers, I think in the, in the last decades, uh, that this is actually more important than the method itself. Uh, it doesn't, you know, uh, it's not important whether it's behavioral, uh, cognitive behavioral uh, therapy or psychoanalysis. But um, and, and, and the reputation of the healer, uh, so that he's embedded in a community and that he's uh, uh, processed values of the community and um, and this also makes the the, the trans a transpersonal factor. Yeah, that uh, this healing is acknowledged by by the by the community, which gives security and and makes it uh, successful. And um, the, the other thing I was uh, thinking also was that uh, the, the focus on, on mysticism, um, because I think they, they, come straight, they come straight to the point. I mean, we sometimes do therapies which take long, long years just in order to sometimes establish some feeling of mysticism in our therapies. I mean, we wouldn't call it like this, but we would 
aim for moments of now, or we would aim for maybe a, a, a dream that makes a, brings a breakthrough, which are the mystic moments, and and they they focus on nothing else but the mysticism. So it, it's a quite a shortcut, I think, um, but it also ident identifies a very uh, important factor. I think it's very important. It, it's it's a question whether you would name want to name it mysticism, which happens in our uh, therapy. But I think it is it's not very much. It's it's uh, yeah. It's maybe not as um, dramatic. But there, maybe there are little moments of mysticism which we achieve or try to achieve over a long period. Um, I don't know whether anyone has been uh, in the IAAP uh, Congress when the South African healers were uh, talking. Um, they, they had they had like um, they had like a meeting of uh, Jungian. Uh, white um, uh, healers, <laughs> so psychoanalysis, and they had uh, those those traditional healers and they were talking about what do you think, what makes a good therapy, and, and the, the healers from South Africa, the traditional ones, they were absolutely secure that we would talk too much. They said, yeah, you're always talking, and, and we, already, we already know uh, at the beginning, before actually the, the, the client comes to us, what the problem is because our ancestors have told us yeah and they were all very almost bored about the, why do we have to talk about this so this is so clear and um yeah so um it's uh but i, I wonder whether the, the factor um isn't maybe a, a similar one it's just that we spend much more time and we don't do it in a group we do it uh, mostly in the, in the diet so I, I think this is different as well yeah But I guess the death, um, he, he doesn't talk about the death of God in this chapter, you know, that um, the kind of collective identity, collective aspiration, collective values are, um, you know, very hard to come by these days. So, I mean, that's what Jung says, you know, you're on your own. Uh, you gotta you gotta sort it out. Find your own myth. Um, you can't really rely, um, as these South African healers seem to be able to do. They they had great confidence in the ancestors, which on the whole we don't. <laughs> um, I I wonder if if that's about the conviction that the community has that the pain is shared. At least that's how uh, it's come across to me. You ask the community, whose pain is it? Well, you know, they all have it. That's such a tricky idea of the community, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like, I think it is too. <laughs> what, yeah. what community am I a part of? Uh, right. But I think that's what you're talking about also, that we don't really have a sense of that. You know, we don't have a sense of being a community. But I think if we're talking about indigenous people, there is a sense of the community. Hmm. And certainly in the South African uh, examples, um, there's a very a strong conviction of community. That's, I think, what they're so talking about in terms of ancestors. And, and is it, do you pronounce your, your name, uh, Aunt Chi? I don't want to embarrass myself, so I thought I'd ask. Uh, it's it's Antje. Antje, okay. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Um, Welcome. <laughs> I thought you made some good points about 
the, the notion of the conviction that um, the shaman or the medicine man in the chapter held uh, in great esteem their, their capacities, their method, their techniques, that um, if, I'm, if I'm not mistake, mistaken in remembering, some, some shaman wanted to be paid even though the patient or the client didn't feel any better. <laughs> And uh, it, it almost sounds like uh, the transference would be so strong to the healer that you would just accept the fact that your headache's not going to go away, but everything's okay. I think maybe he was healed, uh, healed uh, this, this guy who still had his headache, yeah, um, and as this is also what Ellenberger wrote, uh, we don't know how he actually worked and what he wanted, maybe he was, you know, if he would do a catamnesis uh, some, some weeks later, maybe there were some major <laughs> um, changes going on, you don't know. Mm. I mean, we, we don't have the approach to, to uh, heal the symptoms of our patients straight away as, as depth psychologists. psychologists. No. Sure. We, we but, try not to have it. <laughs> there's also, there's also though, um, a f this, a notion of conviction that the therapists, who, however they practice, are, are quite identified with their method. If, if there is a method, if you could define it, um, to the degree that they're not willing to abandon it for other approaches that other people are saying could be equally, if not more helpful to others. And I, I, I'm quite aware of that bias in myself. Of like, if I'm told to practice uh, CBT or transactional analysis, I think Steve <coughs> talks about that a lot. Um, if I, if I had to practice what uh, motion focused therapy, any of these technique -y, um, approaches to healing, I, I just by definition resist. And maybe it's my own countertransference, but I, I think it has much more to do with who I am as a human being or as a person that I, I'm not here, to act gimmicky or mimic people or, or put out a, a quote method uh, or approach to living. But at the same time, I realized all the hidden rituals involved in uh, the therapy, which we obviously would have gotten from, uh, you know, the indigenous uh, communities. Uh, the, 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 or, or at least the notion of ritual is very important to what we do as a profession. He, he talks about the difference between the lay therapist and the kind of shaman. And the lay therapist seems to be like a kind of, um, you know, therapists who are out to have results. Right. And, um, and deal with a lot of practical things and goals and things like that. Whereas the shaman seems more interested in retrieving the soul. And um, so I, I, it made me wonder about, you know, that there is a kind of distinction in psychotherapy today between the more practical goal oriented <laughs> um, therapies and then the sort of more long term um soul retrieval kind of therapies that are based on counter transference and so on um, so you i mean you seem john to be very much in that line rather than uh, getting problems sorted out yeah i've just l learned to live with mine You know, there's been 
so much caricatures made of the shaman. You, you, you hardly have anything that's really accurate. And so even this idea that they're convinced, that they're so convinced, uh, I don't think that that's what's going on. I don't think they think that's what's going on. Um, and those people that I've met, they're very willing to have their patients do other therapies. You know, they'll send them to a medical doctor if they think something is better there. So the thing that there is about, I think, being convinced that I've heard, um, the one, the one shamaness, uh, when she was passing her gift, uh, she said to the next one, she said, your biggest problem is if you don't believe enough. Now, you could think that that's about conviction, but it wasn't. Because what she was saying to him was that you have to hold an experience. You have to hold an image. You have to hold a picture. You have to hold a thought. Because if you don't believe enough, you won't hold it. The way I think about that is that yeah. I often say in supervision, you know, you're, you're the biggest, one of the biggest things you need to decide on is the death instinct. Yeah. So, um, you know, if you're seeing somebody two, three, four times a week and it's you're into your seventh or eighth year, you better have made a decision about certain things, <laughs> you know, and uh, because you need to steer your ship in some way. You can't just decide from day to day what you um, you think is the case about the psyche. You have, I suppose that to me resonates with belief. There's certain, you have to have in your own mind, in your it resolved in yourself, you know, certain fundamental things. That sounds very much like what that person is saying. I think so, yeah. I read the idea of conviction in that chapter quite differently. I read it as the shaman being an effective hypnotherapist. Mm -hmm. Can I throw in a little bit of a, a curveball? Because there are one or two things that um, various people have said, particularly John, for instance, about learning to live with things uh, and so on. Um, I, I read this um, chapter, I think, before I just started doing my MA in, in uh, I think, Jungian and post-Jungian studies. I think it, uh, Roderick, is it, is it still on the reading list or was it on the reading list for the MA at one stage? So uh, I remember... Yes, so it, it would have been. I, I, I don't know. Probably still is somewhere. Right. Um, and, and it felt a bit like the experience of sort of coming back and, and, and you know, it not being the same river because um, I, I, when I read it, I, when I looked at it, I, I looked at it in a completely different light because my immediate reaction was there's something wrong with this place and I, with this chapter. And I think that the reason for saying that is that, um, you, know, you know, when you look at the criticisms that Foucault has, for, instance, for example, of psychiatry in the, um, you know, the 19th century, it raises questions about some, of, you know, some of these societies here. Is it the individual that's ill, or is it the society that's ill, or even, you know, is that is there no illness that needs to be healed? There's no healing as such that's required. Just like you know, John said, you know, needing just learning to live with things. Um, this is going to sound trite, but it's not, it's not meant to be trite. But I think it's just very illuminative. In, in the, uh, the film Crocodile Dundee, there's 
a conversation between Paul Hogan and the um, the, the Linda uh, Kozalski character, where um, she says that a friend is going to see her shrink. He said, what's a shrink? He says, oh, it's somebody you go to to talk about your problems. And he says, hasn't she got any friends? And, and, and it's almost as if, you know, the point that Crocodile and team was making was that psychiatry was taking the place of normal community, normal relationships. Um, and I, 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 you know, think as well of, of um, you know, some of Jung's statements about, you know, suffering is the normal, is, is a, the normal counterpole to happiness and, and, uh, and so on. So it, it, the question I'm raising is whether, you know, whether the idea of, of healing being necessary is really what underpins this. And I, I just I just have doubt, you know, doubts about that word healing, whether it is really as fundamental as it seems to be throughout this chapter. I guess it, to me, it seems that humans are desperate for something. Um, whether you want to call it healing or salvation or relief, uh, reassurance, that the, there is a kind of desperate I don't know, just desperation that, that is part of human living that seems to me to be expressed in some of these things. And it, I mean, it isn't that uh, people had friends that they could talk to. There, there have always been priests and shamans and healers uh, who are on the edge of things. Um, so, and I think, you know, Jung writes about clergy or therapists that. So they're, you know, the, the therapists are taking on a lot of the clergy's roles and so on. So I think that, I don't think this idea that there was a time when everybody, you know, had friends they could talk with around the fire and everything was hunky-dory. I don't really think that, um, that washes. I wasn't, you know, suggesting that there were, you know, there's a sort of romantic age of the past where everybody was was happy because they they talked to each other. It it was more the, you know, the idea that um, the problem could be in society that that, um, you know, if people did feel desperate, it may be nothing wrong with them. And again, it's another argument that Young makes. It may be something wrong with society that somehow the society can't accept them. In fact, one of the one of the um, in, in the checklist at the front one of the things is sort of like uh, somebody needs to be healed of breaking a taboo if i if i remember correctly i can't immediately find it um as, as an example uh where so the problem is actually perhaps in society that it doesn't doesn't accept um certain types of behavior that actually ought to be considered to be quite normal so it's it's a question of what what is normal and 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 what what is it that requires healing and you know, maybe that, you know, I mean, the Scott Peck argument in, in Road Less Traveled is that we actually, it is normal to actually experience these difficult times, you know, of suffering, um, you know, as part of our character uh, development. And because, maybe the, the idea to, to ameliorate it or mitigate it um, isn't always the right thing to do. I don't think that therapy necessarily am ameliorates it right away. It could make it worse. Um, it can be bring the pain out more sharply. And then anyway, therapists are part of society. So I don't really see quite uh, how you're drawing such a sharp um, line between a private conversation and what's social. It's, it's not a, it's, it's not a sharp line it's it's the it's the establishment of norms of collective norms and then as a result of those norms being imposed on individuals then being made to feel that they are something wrong with them simply because they don't you know fit in with those social norms it's not a sharp line i don't think by any means because because norms you know change over you know over years i remember uh about 30 years ago i was on a psychology course and saw a video of 
a lady in a psychiatric institution who was in her 80s. And she was put there as a teenager because she had had a, a baby out of wedlock. And um, so this must have been sort of late, very late 19th century or early 20th century um, that, uh, that, that, that it happened. And at that point, when she went in, that, that's how, you know, that was viewed as a psychiatric illness, the fact that she had a baby uh, out, of, out, out of wedlock. And yet now we'd look upon that as really quite an absurd thing to have done. Um, and and it's, just, it's just a part of normal life now. And so, well, it, it's it's, and yet in, it, it's a part of normal life, and yet therapists are doing a booming business. So, mm. I'm not quite sure what you're getting at. I mean, it is an inter it does go to an interesting discussion, which is that all of the emphasis on so psychosocial things on therapy trainings. So there's there's now a kind of question. Well is psychotherapy, is psychoanalytic psychotherapy really an application of psychosocial studies? Or, I mean, uh, all of the emphasis that, you know, things are looked at in psychosocial studies, are they of any use in individual therapy? Um, you know, you talk about I don't know, all these big social issues and social complicated social identity problems. But if you're just one-to-one -one with somebody in a room, to what degree do those really, uh, can you make use of that in any way? So is, is emphasizing those things on psychotherapy trainings really uh, helping the trainee or just de-skilling them in a way. I'm wondering because the, because the trainee in the therapy room isn't treating society. They aren't even treating a person. They're having a conversation with an individual. Um, sorry, I've interrupted somebody. No, I thought it might be helpful uh, to give a, a, a real solid uh, example uh, where you can look at all these questions and see what you think about it. Um, so I'll give you a, um, a story that I heard. And uh, I had to think of it because of this poor lady who's, who has had a child out of wedlock and what happened to her. So this is how the story goes um, by the Sami that I've been staying with. And it's not happening, in fact, anymore. Uh, but this is what it used to happen is that a, 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 a baby uh, born and it would be assumed it would be out of wedlock or it would, might be a baby born uh, under rather desperate uh, circumstances. Maybe the, the, the girl was raped or who knows what. Anyway, so uh, um, nobody ever says anything about that. But um, uh, uh, between two villages, uh, there's constantly being heard the cries of a baby. And everybody thinks that uh, there's been a baby abandoned there. So, and that's what everybody's hearing as they're going from village to village. Uh, they're hearing the baby crying. So they send out a healer. And the healer goes to that spot, uh, which is what you want to say about it. You can say it's 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 haunted. You know, it, they have a they have actually a name for this. It's called an eparash. Um, so it's an it's an eparash which is haunting that location. So the healer goes there, and the reason that it's an eparash and the reason that it's haunting its location is because it doesn't have a name. It has no other, and the healer comes to that location, starts to talk to the Eparash and says, it's, it's known, we know now what happened. And we know that you didn't have a connection to go to. So you're just connected to where you died. So I'm going to give you a connection. And that connection is to God 
and then you can go there. And that's the solution. So those, all those things about, well, is the community carrying this? Uh, well, I think so. You know, I think everybody's hurting. Nobody's saying that the girl did something wrong. Nobody's pointing a finger at her. But they're all suffering. And so they find a way to, uh, to make this haunting resolved. And they send the healer and the healer says, okay, we know because in here it is, you know, if the story gets told, so, because the idea in that culture is that an untold story becomes a ghost. So the story gets told and then this, this Eparash, everybody's convinced that this uh, Eparash now can go to God and everybody's happy. I wish that would work for climate change, Barbara. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, the indigenous people, they really do have a way to, to work with climate change, you know? I think it might apply to climate change, actually, because what I'm taking from that is this idea of connectedness and interconnectedness right. and the importance of that. And I think in a way, talking about inner and outer is a bit of a false dichotomy because if we talked about interconnectedness and how connected a person is and whether connection is actually right connection is actually what we're looking for as a healing I think that we've got quite a lot in, in, enclosed in that idea and also this idea of the I was really interested in the idea of the thin and the thick um, individuals and the thin, so uh, this idea of the, the more porous a person is, so the more uh, they are connected, perhaps, rather than it being more at the mercy of the outer, maybe it's about being more interconnected. Intersubjectivity. Yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yes. Exactly that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'm. I'm kind of thinking. You know, I'm. I'm, I'm thinking of the distinction actually between the psychotherapist and the and the shaman, because the shaman actually I see is very much part of a kind of coherent story of of himself in society. It's, it's so it's it's very coherent. Yeah. Where, where, uh, whereas the psychotherapist is working, you know, it's 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 not it's not it's it's lost. It's, it doesn't have the same coherence. Is it? You know, it, it, it doesn't share the same story as society. It isn't a kind of like a coherent story within to operate, really. You no. Know? Mm. I think you know therapists are trying to make a coherent story out of. Uh, regulation and registration, but it doesn't really work because there is it's sort of slightly delusional way of c creating <laughs> uh, value and uh, meaning and so on. So, but I must say this discussion is leaving me a bit quite sad. This idea of community that, uh, well, allegedly these people have you know, good communities or coherent communities or coherent narratives and stories. And we live in a, such a fragmented, uh, bitty existence. Uh, 
fragmented. Just, uh, just to go back to Steve's point about the disease being in the society, not, not in the individual. And I was trying to transpose that into um, our roles potentially as therapists in, in the current social environment. And my thought went to, you know, the disease is that um, I'm not happy. Um, if the society, the one coherence we possibly do have in Western society particularly, is that we're meant to be striving for happiness and experiencing happiness. Therefore, when we start to define suffering, um, the anxiety around not feeling happy is potentially plays into what you were suggesting, Steve, is in, in the sense that um, I've come to you for conversation to help me understand you know, why I'm not happy. Um, but I'm still trying to understand why I'm not fitting into what I perceive to be the norm, which is that you know, I should be happy. Um, so I'm, I'm, there must be something wrong with me for not, for not being happy. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I was just trying to understand a, a modern equivalent of the primitive sense of, of not fitting in with the society around them. Yeah, that, that, was, that was exactly what I was getting at. And, and you know, there's, there's a couple of things there about also uh, suffering itself being a normal experience and something that we just accept rather than think that we've somehow got to be cured from it and be happy all the time. And that in itself is creating a problem. The fact that, we, you know, as you say, we still have to strive to be, to be happy. So, so there are a few sort of dichotomies there. Is the, is the disease within or is it, or is it within the, the society that's, that's around? And therefore, the, the, you know, there's a feeling of ill ease. Um, or, and, and, and maybe as well, there's that, that uh, contrast between the feeling of happiness and the, and the feeling of suffering where they are just, you know, I mean, Jung said it uh, explicitly, they're just normal counterpoles, um, and we just need to accept them as part of, uh, part of life. And the other, the other side of the, of the, the, the happiness coin, of course, is success as well. We, we suffer from uh, the disease of, of misunderstanding success. We've, we've forgotten success comes in many shapes and forms depending on the criteria that we're going to use for that but it, it's become an overwhelming materialistic um, goal and and therefore those that aren't achieving the goal are, are somehow failing in some way and and so um, anybody who's able to speak to entrepreneurialism for example becomes a celebrity therapist on stage and on social media and so on. So it's, I just think that's another similar par parallel there. I don't know if this is the case in the UK, um, but in Canada, yeah. when I um, we're, 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 I guess, under siege with a, a mental health crisis here um, that's obviously been pronounced since the pandemic, but, um, but we don't have the proper resources to serve the public. So what, what David mentioned about psychotherapists being in demand is clearly the case here. Um, but the cottage industry is really about wanting to take away symptoms. So either you, the psychiatrist will give medication. They won't talk to you, psychiatrist here, at least in Canada, unless you're fortunate enough to get a psychoanalyst. Um, but almost all of the talk therapies, um, are all oriented toward symptom relief, symptom management. And um, it seems to be so different than 
uh, let's say a non-directed approach um, that a psychoanalytic method might um, be more inclined to follow. Uh, particularly also getting back to the notion of this, you know, the, the notion of suffering. I mean, let's face it, we're all, you know, we all suffer. Um, you know, we're all neurotic, uh, as Freud would say. Um, it's just a matter of degree. Uh, so how do we take a normativity such as a, a universal statement like that and then apply it to people who believe that there are clear distinctions between what's normal and abnormal? Um, and so tying this back into the chapter, uh, I wonder if, if anyone has a thought or a comment about the how how do how would these um, ancient societies view psychopathology? Because for me, um, I you know psychopathology is very real. Yeah, whether it be within the, the individual psyche or within uh, collective social. Uh, you know, structures such as society. I think there's a big problem there because a lot of the beliefs of, well, a lot, the beliefs of indigenous societies have been interpreted as pathological. So a belief of the in the soul being able to survive outside the body, for instance, would quite often be, could be taken as a sign of a person's delusion. And then the civilizing um, influence of the colonist, the colonizer, is to then take the child out of that social context, that, that culture, and properly educate them into our version of sanity. So I think, I think that's quite problematic to talk about personally. So what's, what's problematic? Um, talking about the, in the so-called primitive indigenous cultures and um, how they regard psychopathology. I mean, in one sense, I think it probably be pretty much the same. They'd find it very interesting, uh, but what they wouldn't regard as pathological, we might. So in that sense, problematical. I guess I'll try to weigh in here again. Um, uh, um, I just happened to have in my hand um, Guggenbill Craig uh, and his uh, The Emptied Soul on the Nature of Psychopath, the Psychopath. And um, he's saying that there are, you could say, uh, uh, parts of us uh, that are empty of eros. And that's the psychopath and that's a sociopath, is wherever there is a lack of uh, emptiness, he calls, you know, crippled, crippled arrows. Um, and I think that that tallies pretty well with what I've also seen for um, among the Sami, what is actually would be considered a psychopath. And that would be that there's an absence of arrows. And that goes back to uh, just connection, you know, when somebody is not connected. Sorry, Barbara, an absence of, of errors? Errors, oh. yes, errors. Ah, errors, all oh, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what uh, uh, Guggen Guggenbill, I just wanted to check if I'm saying it right. He, he, he says that um, he sees psychopathology uh, Oh, the psychopath the, is not so much a deficiency of morality as it is crippled eros. 
and I think that that works with uh, with um, indigenous peoples um, concepts of what is um, pathology. So, so would uh, Barbara would they have um, a, a concept such as um, an, an attachment disorder in early childhood or attachment deficits with parents in early childhood that would translate into the notion of crippled arrows, uh, meaning that you, if you don't feel love and emotional connection and attachment to your parents. You're going to be a psychopath in, in uh, at least in this country. Right. Uh, yeah, I understand that for us. Yeah, in this country, yes. Uh, I, I don't think they would say it that way. I don't think they're looking at children. Uh, that's I thought was also interesting. Uh, what David was bringing out uh, that there that maybe there isn't looking at children the way we're looking at children. Wouldn't they regard any psychopathology as a, as a spiritual crisis in some way? And um, maybe they have their own uh, definitions of, of what, uh, what quality in the spirituality uh, is, is hindered or disturbed. Yeah, the, the, it's going to be a, a hard thing, uh, a spirituality, <laughs> you mm. know, because uh, uh, if I'm asking, uh, uh, what is spirit? Uh, they'll, they'll they'll say it's thoughts. Thoughts are spirit. So mm -hmm. uh, they very well see that you can become fixated, just like we see it uh, in in a psychoanalysis, that you get fixated on something. So you're spirit then your thoughts uh, are if it's fixated um, then you are uh, uh, you're not including or not able uh, to basically move uh, so one of their biggest uh, um, way to say somebody is being um, cursed is from the immobility they can't move Now, to me, that's very similar to, to how we see uh, an actual flow in our lives or a lack of flow, if you want to call it flow. Meaning where people get stuck. Yeah. Yeah, they can't move beyond. I mean, I know it's a cliche, but I mean, psychopathology just means suffering of the soul, doesn't it? So, um, but I guess it has some additional kind of implications when, when we use the word, we don't mean it just as suffering of the soul. Mm -hmm. I had, you know, I, I was trying to find this discussion, which vaguely I remember. I, didn't, I don't know how much of it's from Hillman, because Hillman makes a big deal about the difference between soul and spirit. But I think there's also a discussion in Jung about soul and spirit, isn't there? And, and that this discussion I'm thinking of um, was that... Um, psychopathology uh, is from the spirits, not from the soul. You know, the soul is uh, homely, the, the soul is nearby, the soul is connected to nature, and it's the spirits that are dangerous. Um, and, uh, you know, we meet the soul in the garden or wherever, but the spirits are in the desert or whatever, in the mountains, and they can really get you. So, um, 
but I didn't get enough. Uh, I, didn't, I wasn't able to find enough to, to make much of it, but I do find that an interesting difference between soul and spirit. And also this idea that what's really dangerous are the spirits that, um, that come at night and come in the dark or come in, in dry places, deserts and so on. I, I always, is, that, is that implying that the spirits belong to the wilderness, do you think? I think it's implying they're, they're alien, they're more alien. Alien, okay. But, but Jung used the concept spirit, I am assuming in the German, Geist, and so I always just read that as, as uh, the equivalent of mind, whereas well, soul was psyche. I think you're right, but it, it, uh, there was just, I think, one particular chapter where he did this kind of thing about spirits being dangerous. But the, in generally, I think you're correct that it's, it's not. Uh, I think it might be in his, uh, there were two papers, I think, where he discusses this in, in some detail. One is spirit and life, I think it is. And the other one is, I think it's the phenomenology of spirit in fairy tales, maybe. Um, or, or it's either that one or there's another one with the, the, the word spirit in the title, where, where he, he discusses the distinctions between soul and spirit in, in some detail. And I, th I think includes these thoughts there. But, but generally, yeah, he, you know, the geist is, is, uh, is, is the word he often means when he's using the word, you know, geistlich, when he's using the word spiritual and so on, um, I think. It's so confusing because uh, if, if, we, if we say spirituality, we refer to something which is probably beyond, beyond mind, isn't it? Uh, which, which includes the soul as well. I mean, you, you can't, it's, it's definitely yeah. connected. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I think, I mean, definitely Jung recognized um, spirit as something different from from psyche or from mm. just sort of m m mentality. And there's a discussion he had in a in a letter with uh, in part of his correspondence with Wolfgang Pauli, where they're talking about um, psyche and matter, and 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 uh, Jung oh, and, and Jung brings in the concept of spirit um, uh, precisely. To di uh, something different from psyche because he wants to suggest that there's a, a polarity between matter and spirit and psyche in some way mediates between the two um so he's you know in that context he's he's um he's, he's creating a you know this he's sort of introducing that the sort of traditional um tripartite division as it, as it were of of, of sort of phys the physical the, the psychic and the spiritual um so um, I mean, he's not consistent in doing that, but he, he certainly does that at times. He collapses them together at one stage as well, Roderick, because I, I can't remember where it's from, but he also talks about um, matter and spirit being things that, you know, may actually be the same thing, but we just stick the label on them of matter and spirit according yeah. to what they, they appear like. So, you know, yes, they're outside the psyche, they're, they're extra poles, but they may actually be the same, the yeah. same substance, and we just stick on the label uh, according to how we understand them yeah he, he, he talks about that many you yeah, know many places yeah he also talks about spirit um in mysterium conjunctionis in terms of it being quite a rarefied um quality that um has something uh that's moral or ethical or some sense of judgment of what's right and wrong um and i think that kind of feeds into what you were saying steve about suffering um, and in my clinical work anyway, thinking about different types of suffering and um, one type of suffering being the type of suffering that, that comes from judgment, uh, maybe judgment arising from spirit, the sense of what one should and shouldn't be doing, what's right and wrong on it in a kind of ethical or moral sense. Um, but then maybe there's a type of suffering that's more related to soul, uh, which isn't about judgment per se, but about um, the nature of loss or um, death or endings and so on and so forth that that isn't being judged per se um so for example i've got uh, my dog with me um 
which doesn't I don't think he has a sense of kind of judgment but um uh my wife's upstairs and he's in a great deal of kind of emotional distress and suffering I think on a probably a kind of soul level um uh because of that and he's kind of whining and so on rather than a kind of judgment judgment level so I think there might be something about um where judgment fits in or ethics fits in uh versus a kind of existential suffering that that doesn't necessarily hold uh judgment in terms of a right or wrong kind of sense yeah i'll put a stake in front of him and i'm sure he'll choose that over his his alpo dog, dog food <laughs> his soul's easily satisfied yeah So it does link back to um, uh, the, the topic of uh, Eros uh, as well, because in Cytological Types, in Chapter 5, Jung uses Prometheus and Epimetheus as the basis of the book. And the point about Prometheus is that when Epimetheus gets appointed king, Prometheus loses his connection with society, and then he goes into a, into a suffering state. So I think there the suffering state is just through the the lack of connection with um, <laughs> between Prometheus and society, or between <laughs> between the dog and your wife, is <laughs> comparable. There was an interesting uh, thing he said here about um, ceremony that, um, that these indigenous or traditional forms of healing and so on involve ceremony which he, he says that modern psychotherapy doesn't i guess we have our own little ceremonies <laughs> but they're not um on the whole like full-blown ceremonial events uh, are the psychotherapy but i wondered how that relates to this question of the social and the community and um what kind of ceremonies would be would we find meaningful or comforting or would we even be willing to participate in you know are we quite um cautious about being caught up in other people's ceremonies or ceremonies that we feel might be sort of inauthentic or uh, um, I suppose in a way each analytic couple, each therapeutic couple develops its own ceremonies, its own language, but those are quite private, <laughs> aren't they? And uh, only the two parties really know about it. Um, but, uh, I thought that was interesting that that link with ceremony or pageantry or liturgy or whatever sort of not a big feature of what we do actually i just want to say not in relation to psychotherapy but i went to the went to the yoga class last night mm -hmm. and i found it very interesting in the sense that it wasn't just about exercise it was a you know we, we kind of walked in and the teacher was kind of playing kind of well i don't know what kind of music but i thought kind of indie music and then she kind of you know there was some you know she did some chanting a little bit so i, I kind of for me it, it made you know it kind of it, it connected to something kind of beyond you know beyond the the extra physical exercise <clears throat> I also minded a bit of um, the group dynamic um, and sort of ceremony of Alcoholics Anonymous and the importance of that to people who 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 need that that group dynamic and the the you know where they declare their name and um, identify themselves as as an alcoholic and and how that builds that sense of belonging and support. I guess that's that's a sense of ceremony there. What about things like, for example, on uh, Wednesdays at 12 o'clock, 
um, millions of people tune into uh, BBC Two or BBC News or Sky News or whatever to watch um, uh, parliamentary questions, Prime Minister's question, uh, questions in the House of Commons. You know, there's almost something ceremonial about that. And although you aren't in necessarily in the same room with everybody else, you're doing it through the, you know, through the TV screen in front of you. It's become as much a part of the sort of the ritual of um, uh, of uh, contemporary politics in the UK um, as as perhaps any 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 kind of uh, uh, ceremony that uh, that we might have. I think the point he made in the chapter was that these healing rituals, um, healing events were ceremonial in a way that if you go to see your therapist or if you go to the psychiatrist, there might be some very depleted <laughs> element of ceremony in it, but it isn't um, that well, kind of social ceremony is not really part of it. Unless, you know, after your session, you might meet your mates in the for a coffee and you all talk about your therapy or something like that, I suppose. But that's not, it's not quite the same thing. But the, those indigenous ceremonies, they, they are really about the transpersonal. And this is very, this is harder to convey if you're, if you're just the two of, of you, the, the, the client and yourself. Um, I mean, some clients even don't understand that the therapist is part of the whole thing because they think that you know, he's just like, a, um, he brings a service and, and so on. And um, uh, to, I think, I think the rit the ritual is maybe that um, I, I I don't think there there are many but the frame of the of the sessions you know like maybe handshake and former times we, we shook hands uh, yeah the fifty minutes that we spend and um, but it's the transpersonal which is I think the, the the factor about the ceremony where which has such a healing effect which also came across in the examples in the in the first chapter of Alan Berger that it's about that you're included into something which is beyond your, your own soul, your own personal life and your, your personal becoming. And the connection to that has to be re-established uh, in some way. I think this is also probably part of the suffering. You suffer, you suffer because you don't feel connected to the transpersonal anymore. So you're stuck, maybe. But I guess people do find that through the therapy, don't they? That um, I mean, just thinking about somebody who the first session I asked about parents and siblings, and they said, oh, they had absolutely no connection with them at all. Within a few years, this person was going to all of the Christmas and New Year's and birthdays and on the phone. So somehow through the therapy found a connection, even though it wasn't. And maybe for that person, it felt more real somehow that, um, mm. that it, something she could arrive at in her own time, in her own way. But to say it in a Jungian way, she was probably re reconnected to herself. Yes. And the self is transpersonal, mm. I would say. I mean, what Jung has said that struck me as, as a good way to put it in terms of indigenous uh, healing. Uh, he's he said it's the uh, getting back to the to the ground, the archetypal ground, and thereby one is uh, um, again connected. And I think that's then the, whatever it is that the ceremony is doing, it can be something about that, about the, the archetype being again uh, uh, lived and grounding. Yes, because with the, the fox spirit and the fox temple, there wasn't any collective aspect of that, although it did feel very ceremonial. So 
so I don't know whether do you, do you need the collective in order to have a ceremony or can an individual going to a designated place and connecting with an archetype be seen as ceremonial in its own right? Well, don't you think the place in itself is a, was ceremonial and then the fox, the oh, yes. fox understanding yeah. of the fox, it wasn't just a random fox, it was the fox. Yeah, it, it was very much a located archetype, wasn't it? Mm. Which, yeah, which we don't, we certainly don't have ceremonially, we don't seem to in our culture. But I guess the therapy room can become a kind of very meaningful yes. space but, uh, for, you know, for the individual. Hmm. Well, one thing I'm left thinking, um, partly from the discussion, but also from reading um, the chapter, or as much of it as I was able to read, um, is, is in what sense Ellen Berger is, um, is right, or, or in what sense we're to understand his, his claim anyway, that, that um, modern dynamic psychotherapy derives from primitive medicine, derives from, and, and, and when he claims that there's an uninterrupted continuity mm -hmm that can be demonstrated between, and he gives the list the more modern, um, only the most mo more modern of, of the, the sort of forms of um, healing that, that, that he's been discussing, namely exorcism, magnetism, magnetism to hypnotism, and hypnotism to, to the modern dynamic therapies. Um, I mean, is it, is it the case, do you think that, um, that, uh, that there, is, there is this this continuity, or is it just that these are different um, but related in some way, um, uh, sort of expressions of yeah, responses to suffering, to doing something about suffering, and so on. Or, or does does um, continuity mean something a bit stronger than that? In the sense that you know the the um, the, the modern um, therapists learn from the hypnotists, then which we know to be the case, and the hypnotists learn from the magnet you know, the, the, the um, mesmerists um, and the mesmerists learn from or were doing parallel things to, to some of what the exorcists did, you know, that there were competitions between the exorcists and the, and the, the magnetists and so on. Um, so you can see this in the more modern period that there are, there are definite sort of connections historically from one to another. But, um, but when you go into these more sort of indigenous um, uh, and shamanic and uh, sorts of traditions. Um, is is there a continuity, or, or or is you know, or is it the sense that there's a common humanity that's responding in 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 ways that turn out to be analogous in important respects? So I'm just wondering what the kind, what the if it's a sort of a transmission kind of continuity, or a or a you know a, 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 you know one thing and gets. Sort of bleeds into the next, or, or or whatever, or there is, or it's just a, a reemergence of of something that's that's because we're the kind of human beings we are. Uh, it's a really interesting combination of continuity and conflict. Um, what you were saying, Roderick, made me think about um, Freud's remarks to Jung about uh, wanting to utilize psychoanalysis to, um, you know protect the edifice of psychoanalysis from the black mud or the black tide of occultism and what that desire to protect actually represented. Um, and yet if you go ahead to someone like, as we've talked before about with James Grotstein and his formulation of a sort of phenomenal and noumenal self, um, which he writes about in his book, Who is the Dreamer Who Dream, Dreams the Dream? For me, it has a real kind of, uh, flavor of the antique theurgy translated into a psychoanalytic register. Um, so if there is a kind of continuity going on, I think it, it's very, very complex and, and written with all sorts of conflicts. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I suppose I wonder what, um, 
I mean, in, in, in Ellenberger's case, I mean, he's, he's obviously drawing on what sources he had, I mean, what, what sources he had available, which seems to be quite a lot. Um, and his, you know, his synthesis of, of the, the information in this, this sort of tome as a whole is, is really quite extraordinary. But he, but he was also, you know, in a sense, limited by his sources and his, his ways of thinking. I mean, when he, when he discusses magic, for example, he has a very sort of Taylorian and Fraserian kind of understanding of, 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 of magic, I think, which um, contemporary scholars of, of that field might, might think was rather, rather limited, I think. Um, but you know, yeah, so it's just just uh, mm. thinking about the, the, the what Ellenberger and his context and and uh, the sorts of connections that he was making and able to make because of his own assumptions amongst this material that he that he'd um, he'd, he'd amassed, and whether his narrative that he develops is is you know necessarily the best one of for mm. for you know making sense of the, the connections amongst all these different practices. I like the question very much. Uh, um, Roderick, you like also um, Andre Drogers, uh, and he's been busy with this question too. Oh, right. and, okay. Yeah, uh, and I th what he brings up um, and focuses on more than the continuity, he he highlights that there's disruption. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So well, thank you everyone for coming mm -hmm. along for your thoughts and questions. Um, so our next uh, meeting is on the 15th of February and Roderick uh, mm -hmm. is uh, going to you haven't assigned us a reading yet, so um, do, uh, yeah, we I could do that. that now. But would you prefer me to put it in an email? That would be well. You could do both <laughs> if you already know what it is. Yeah. Well, I, I was thinking probably. I mean, the, the theme is psyche, is it? Yeah. Yeah, I, I was thinking if it's not too. I mean, I'm I'm sort of emboldened by the by the reading that you gave us. You know that it was so long to to um to to suggest um, Jung's on the nature of the psyche. If, oh. if, if it hasn't already been discussed. Oh. Okay, on the, okay. It's quite a long text. I can suggest some particular sections to concentrate on if that makes it easier. Uh, if you if you could send those along to me, but I'll uh, I'll send out information soon so people have a chance to yeah. read it. Okay. So thanks very much, everybody. And uh, hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, David. Okay, 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 bye. okay, bye. okay thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. <laughs>